Hawker Siddeley Trident, Wikipedia Audio The Hawker Siddeley HS-121 Trident was a British short-range airliner. It was the first T-tail rear-engined three-engined jet airliner to be designed. It was also the first airliner to make a blind landing in revenue service in 1965. The Trident emerged in response to a call by the state-owned British European Airways Corporation for a jet airliner for its premier West European routes. BEA had been induced by the government to issue this call despite its unwillingness to buy a large jet fleet. The airline's requirements fluctuated greatly in the 1950s and a decade later evolved radically away from what the Trident could offer. Adherence to B's changing specification was widely seen as limiting the Trident's appeal to other airlines and delaying its service entry. During its gestation, the Trident was also involved in a government drive to rationalize the British aircraft industry. The resulting corporate moves and government interventions contributed to delays causing it to enter service two months after its major competitor, the Boeing 727, losing further potential sales as a result. By the end of the program in 1978, 117 Tridents had been produced. B's successor British Airways withdrew its Tridents by the mid-1980s. Trident services ended in China in the early 1990s. Development In 1953, as British European Airways introduced the world's first turboprop-powered civil airliner the Vickers Viscount into passenger service, the operator was already considering what would be required of a potential successor. Following the entry into service of jet airliners in 1952, many airline managers and economists remained skeptical and advocated turboprop airliners as replacements of piston-engined airliners. In 1953, while several manufacturers across the world were investing in pure jet-powered aircraft, BEA chose to favor turboprops on the basis of their superior economics and produced a specification that called for an aircraft capable of seating 100 passengers and attaining a maximum speed of 370 knots. As a result of the BEA specification, Vickers developed an enlarged derivative of the Viscount for BEA, the Vickers Vanguard which was ordered by the airline on July 20, 1956. By this point, however, the French-built Sud Aviation Caravelle had conducted its maiden flight during the previous year and BEA was beginning to recognize that jet aircraft could soon be providing stiff competition. In April 1956, Anthony Millward, Chief Executive of BEA stated that he would rather do without. Nevertheless, in December of that same year Lord Douglas of Kirtleside, B's chairman, stated that it might be necessary for a number of jet-powered short-haul aircraft to be introduced while retaining turboprop aircraft as the mainstay of the company's inventory for the foreseeable future. In July 1956, BEA had announced what it called outline requirements for a short-haul second-generation jet airliner, to work alongside its turboprop fleet. It would carry a payload of some 20,000 pounds or some 70 passengers up to 1,000 miles, weigh about 100,000 pounds, use 6,000 feet runways, cruise at a very high speed of 610 to 620 miles per hour and have more than two engines. According to aviation author Derek Woods, BEA wanted something that was faster than the Caravelle which was threatening to be highly competitive. While not intended as an express requirement, commentators ever since have taken these figures to constitute a definite call to industry. Four companies prepared projects to match the BEA outline. Bristol proposed the initially four-engined Bristol Type 200. 
Avro proposed the futuristic Avro 740 Trigit before shelving it and joining forces with Bristol and Hawker Siddeley. Vickers proposed the VC-114 engined airliner, derived from its in-development VC-10. The de Havilland Company considered three possible contenders for the specification, two of these were four-engined developments of the early Comet, the world's first jet-powered airliner, the D.H.119 and the D.H.120, the latter being also intended to be offered to British Overseas Airways Corporation. In July 1957, de Havilland made another submission in the form of the D.H.121, this proposal was furnished with three Rolls-Royce Avon turbojet engines and greatly resembled the eventual production aircraft. By August 1957, the D.H.121 proposal had been revised, differences included the adoption of the in-development Rolls-Royce Medway turbofan engine, and an expansion to accommodate a maximum of 98 passengers. The D.H.121 was to be the world's first Trigit airliner. Its designers felt this configuration offered a trade-off between cruising economy and take-off safety in case of an engine failure, moreover, the BEA specification had called for more than two engines. Each of the three engines would drive its own hydraulic system offering triple redundancy in case of any of the other systems failing. The engines were to be 13,790 LBF Medway engines. The D.H.121 was to have a gross weight of 123,000 pounds or optionally, up to 150,000 pounds, a range of 2,070 miles and seating for 111 in a two-class layout. The design initially included a cruciform tail layout similar to that of the Caravelle. The engines were clustered at the rear, with the center engine situated in the extreme rear of the fuselage fed by air duct through a large oval intake at the front of the fin, a configuration similar to the later Boeing 727 the design eventually settled on a variable incidence T-tail. From the outset, the D.H.121 was planned to employ avionics which were very advanced for the period. Among other capabilities, they would offer automatic approach and landing within a few years of service entry. The avionics were also to have triplicate components for reliability and to allow majority 2-1 voting for aircraft guidance during automatic approach and landing. The physical dimensions of most avionics of the period required them to be housed in a large compartment beneath the Trident's flight deck, the compartment's size was among the factors dictating a distinctive nose undercarriage design offset by two, fort to the port side and retracting sideways to stow across the D.H.121's longitudinal axis. BEA soon selected the D.H.121 as the basis for detailed negotiations, but these talks were protracted due to multiple factors, including wider policy decisions of the British government and indecision within BEA itself. During the time that the D.H.121 had emerged in the late 1950s, the British government came to view the airframe and aero engine industries as too fragmented into small companies, accordingly, a policy favouring mergers into a few large groups was adopted. De Havilland was keen to retain their independence and leadership of the D.H.121 and thus approached the government with a proposal to form a consortium under which de Havilland would produce the fuselage, Bristol would manufacture the wings, and various other companies, including hunting aircraft and ferry aviation would be responsible for other elements, however, Bristol strongly opposed this arrangement and chose to work with Hawker Siddeley in competition against de Havilland.
Companies vigorously competed to be selected by BEA due to the lure of its £30 million contract, as well as the likelihood of lucrative overseas export sales. On February 4, 1958, de Havilland, along with Hunting and Ferry, announced that they had agreed to form a partnership for the purpose of manufacturing and marketing the D.H.121, the consortium adopted the corporate name of the defunct Airco Company, which had been Geoffrey de Havilland's employer during the First World War. The Minister of Supply stated of the Airco Consortium that this is not quite what had in mind. Nevertheless, both Airco and the rival Bristol Hawker Siddeley team proceeded to conduct their own approaches to various overseas airlines, sufficiently interested. American airline Pan American World Airways invited both teams to present their proposed airliners in January 1958. Sir Matthew Slattery, chairman of Bristol and Short Brothers, appealed for BEA to delay any decision until after one of the competing firms had already secured an export order for their airliner. In response, Lord Douglas stated that BEA wished to order the D.H.121 and was awaiting approval from the government. Douglas's reply has been viewed as the death knell for the rival Type 200 proposal. Meanwhile, a new prospective rival airliner emerged, this time from Boeing in the United States, in the form of the Boeing 727, which also had a trijet configuration. Boeing had begun its studies into this sector of the market in 1956, and elected to launch its own trijet program in 1959. Airco executives who were at the time intensely exploring various alternatives and further partnerships with other aircraft companies, considered the possibility that Boeing might choose to drop the 727 project and instead CO manufacture the Airco D.H.121 in the USA, Lord Douglas was one of the proponents of this initiative. As a result, Airco invited a team of Boeing engineers and executives to Hatfield, however, Boeing revealed few details of their plans for the 727, while virtually all information on the D.H.121 had been shared with Boeing, an openness that had allegedly amazed Boeing. British commentators have tended to interpret this episode as involving the acquisition of sensitive proprietary data on the D.H.121 by a direct competitor. Woods described the action as de Havilland solemnly handed all its research over to its rivals, the crowning piece of stupidity. On February 12, 1958, the British government authorised BEA to commence contractual negotiations along with the issuing of a letter of intent for 24 aircraft. Accordingly, that same month, BEA announced that the D.H.121 had come closest to its requirements and that it would proceed to order 24 with options on 12 more. It took a further six months for the government to approve a formal BEA order for the D.H.121, the government had favoured the Bristol 200 for industrial policy reasons. Reportedly, BEA had a considerable interest in the Caravelle itself, however this would have been a politically unacceptable choice. BEA also favoured de Havilland, and therefore the Trident submission, due to the firm's established experience with jet airlines with its prior development of the Comet. Background and Original Specification In April 1958, de Havilland firmed the general configuration of the D.H.121 and established a development timetable, including a projected date for the type's maiden flight to be conducted during mid-1961. The company's market research department was forecasting that as many as 550 airliners in its category would be sold by 1965. 
noting that a greater preference for the seating dimensions of what would become economy class was emerging amongst airlines, design alterations were made to adopt a slightly larger diameter fuselage to accommodate six abreast seating, providing for a maximum configuration of 111 seats. According to Woods, this enlarged version of the D.H.121 was on the verge of building the right aeroplane for the market and the success of the Viscount looked like being repeated. In March 1959, BEA, which had become concerned by a recent decline in passenger growth, concluded that the D.H.121's payload range capacity could be too great for their needs and petitioned to Haviland to reduce the scale of the design to suit their revised projections. Fearing that the proposed scale of the Trident was too large, the airline had elected to effectively tear up the program for its redesigning for their immediate situation. In 1959, BEA had a large fleet in operation and on order, and the issue of overcapacity was a critical concern. The airline's concerns reflected three factors, a short-lived airline recession in the late 1950s, the imminent arrival into service of a large fleet of turboprop Vickers vanguards which duplicated the D.H.121's general payload range area and the growing trend to higher density seating. Although de Havilland stated that they generally concurred with BEA, its management also stated that they had worked under terms more onerous than anything DH had previously undertaken. Industry observers at the time felt that the British aircraft industry had again stumbled into the pitfall of having designed exclusively for one customer an aeroplane that has potentially a much wider scope, a sentiment which would be echoed throughout the Trident's subsequent history. The de Havilland board elected to submit to B's demand overriding input from its own sales and market research departments which indicated that other airlines sought the larger model instead. It was, however, noted that de Havilland had not yet secured a formal and final BEA order and that its competitor Bristol was actively promoting their 200 project, which was significantly smaller than the D.H.121. At the time Boeing and Douglas were also downsizing their DC-9 and 727 projects. It was felt the original large D.H.121 would have to compete against the Convair 880 and Boeing 720 some four years after their service entries, whereas a cutback design would be more competitive against the then projected 75-100 seat twin-engined DC-9. Downsizing the Trident involved substantial changes to the design being made, including a power plant change from the Medway to a scaled-down derivative, the 40% less powerful 9,850 pounds F Rolls-Royce Spey 505. The gross weight was cut by about a third to 105,000 pounds while the range was cut by more than half to 930 miles, and mixed-class seating was cut by about a quarter to 75 or 80. Wingspan was reduced by approximately 17 feet, wing area by 30% and overall length by 13 feet. The revised design retained some features of the original one, notably its fuselage diameter. It had a smaller flight deck and single axis, two wheel, four tire main undercarriage legs in place of four wheel bogies. Woods summarized the BEA mandated redesign as, at one blow the 121 was emasculated in terms of size, power, and range. Six months following B's request, de Havilland and the airline came to an agreement on the downsized D.H.121. Details of the emerging aircraft, including its pioneering avionics, were announced to the public in early 1960. It was this revised aircraft that BEA ultimately ordered on August 24, 1959 
initially in 24 examples with 12 options. In September 1960, the future airliner's name, Trident, was announced at the Farnborough Airshow, this name had been chosen as a reflection of its then-unique three-jet, triple hydraulic configuration. By 1960, de Havilland had been acquired by the Hawker Siddeley Group. After the de Havilland takeover, Airco was disbanded. Hunting was marshalled into the competing newly formed British Aircraft Corporation, their departure removed any putative possibility of the Hunting 107 being marketed alongside the D.H.121 as a complementary, smaller member of the same airliner family. Ferry Aviation, partially incorporated into Westland Aircraft, also left the D.H.121 project. With the move to Hawker Siddeley Aviation, the designation was eventually revised to the HS-121. The reorganization of the industry had compounded upon the delays caused by B's changes to the specification, which had in turn harmed the Trident's competitiveness against the Boeing 727. The rival Boeing 727 had quickly established a lead over the Trident. The 727's early lead only strengthened it in subsequent competitions, one such example is Trans Australia Airlines, which had determined the Trident to be superior to the Boeing 727 from an operational standpoint, however it was also viewed as having been commercially risky to choose a different fleet from rival airlines such as Ansett Australia who had already selected the 727. By 1975, only 117 Tridents had been sold against over 1,727s. Industry Consolidation and Selection Revised Specification According to Woods, a significant opportunity that may have enabled the Trident to catch up with the 727 was lost during the 1960s in the form of two competitions for a maritime patrol aircraft, a NATO design competition to replace the Lockheed P-2 Neptune, an Air Staff Requirement 381, which sought a replacement for the Royal Air Force's piston-engined Avro Shackleton. Amongst the various submissions that had been produced in response was a bid by Avro, which had become another member of the Hawker Siddeley Group by that time, which was designated as the Avro 776. The proposed Avro 776 mated the Trident's fuselage with a redesigned and enlarged wing along with more powerful Rolls-Royce RB178 engines capable of 16,300 pounds of thrust. In addition to the maritime patrol requirement, Avro envisioned that the aircraft could be utilized in various military roles including as a 103-seat troop transport as well as being armed with up to four Skybolt air-launched ballistic missile as a nuclear-armed bomber. In addition to Avro's proposals, Armstrong Whitworth had also proposed their own military variants of the Trident. Further Development and Proposals Design Overview Avionics Operational history Later revisions of the Avro 776 substituted the RB.178 engine for the newer Rolls-Royce RB211 turbofan engine, the development of the latter being supported by the 770 SIXS procurement if selected. Rolls-Royce Limited, having shelved development of the Medway following the Trident's redesign, was keen to develop an engine to slot between the 10,000 pounds Spey engine and the 20,000 pounds Rolls-Royce Conway engine, if such an engine had been produced, it could have equipped new versions of the Civil Trident as well. Furnished with a more capable engine that could provide more thrust than the Spey was capable of, 
an extended fuselage could also have been adopted and existing landing restrictions could have been discarded, overall, the Trident would have been a far closer match to the 727. Wood summarized the importance of this perspective development as, for the Trident program, the RB.177 would have been a godsend. At one point, the Avro 776 looked set to win the competition to be selected as the RAF's new maritime patrol aircraft. However, due to a desire to cut costs, the RAF decided to issue an entirely new operational requirement, under which the demands for speed, endurance, and capacity had all been diminished. As a result of the changed requirement, the design team was recalled and the Avro 776 was entirely sidelined for a new proposal. This new proposal, based upon the de Havilland Comet's fuselage, had little to do with the Trident save for the use of its existing Spey engines, this would go on to be selected and procured as the Hawker Siddeley Nimrod. As a result of this loss, prospects for an enlarged Trident equipped with more powerful engines effectively evaporated. The Trident was a jet airliner of all-metal construction with a T-tail and a low-mounted wing with a quarter-cord sweep back of 35 degrees. It had three rear-mounted engines, two inside fuselage pods, and the third in the fuselage tail cone, aspirating through an S-shaped duct. One version, the 3B, had a fourth boost engine aspirated through a separate intake duct above the main S duct. All versions were powered by versions of the Rolls-Royce Spey, while the boost engine was also by Rolls-Royce. The RB.162, originally intended as a lift engine for VTOL applications. Introduction The Trident was one of the fastest subsonic commercial airliners, regularly cruising at over 610 miles per hour. At introduction into service its standard cruise Mach number was 0.88-380 knots IAS probably the highest of any of its contemporaries. Designed for high speed, with a critical Mach number of 0.93, the wing produced relatively limited lift at lower speeds. This, and the aircraft's low power-to-weight ratio, called for prolonged takeoff runs. Nevertheless, the Trident fulfilled B's 6,000 feet field length criterion and its relatively staid airfield performance was deemed adequate before the arrival into service of the Boeing 727 and later jet airliners built to 4,500 feet field length criteria. The aerodynamics and wing was developed by a team led by Richard Clarkson who would later take the Trident's wing design for the wing of the Airbus A300, for the Trident he won the Mullard Award in 1969. The Trident was routinely able to descend at rates of up to 4,500 feet slash min in regular service. In emergency descents it was permissible to use reverse thrust of up to 10,000 feet slash min. Below 280 knots IAS, it was also possible to extend the main landing gear for use as an air brake. The Trident's first version, Trident 1C, had the unusual capability of using reverse thrust prior to touchdown. The throttles could be closed in the flare and reverse idle set to open the reverser buckets. At pilot discretion, up to full reverse thrust could then be used prior to touchdown. This was helpful to reduce hydroplaning and give very short landing runs on wet or slippery runways while preserving wheel brake efficiency and keeping wheel brake temperatures low. Brakes were fitted with the Dunlop Maxarit anti-skid system. The Trident had a complex, sophisticated, and comprehensive avionics fit which was successful in service. This comprised a completely automatic blind landing system developed by Hawker Siddeley and Smith's Aircraft Instruments. 
it was capable of guiding the aircraft automatically during airfield approach, flare, touchdown and even rollout from the landing runway. The system was intended to offer Autoland by 1970. In the event, it enabled the Trident to perform the first automatic landing by a civil airliner in scheduled passenger service on June 10, 1965 and the first genuinely blind landing in scheduled passenger service on November 4, 1966. The ability to land in fog solved a major problem at London Heathrow and other British airports. Delays were commonplace when Category 1 Decision Height and 600-meter Runway Visual Range RVR Instrument Landing System was in use. The Trident's Autoland system pioneered the use of lower landing minima, initially with Category 2 and soon after 00 conditions. Since Tridents could operate safely to airfields equipped with suitable ILS installations, they could operate schedules regardless of weather, while other aircraft were forced to divert. The Trident's advanced avionics displayed the aircraft's momentary position relative to the ground on a moving map display on the center instrument panel. This electromechanical device also recorded the aircraft's track using a stylus plotting on a motor-driven paper map. Positional information was given by a Doppler navigation system which read ground speed and drift data which, alongside heading data, drove the stylus. The Trident was the first airliner fitted with a quick-access flight data recorder. This sampled 13 variables, converted them into a digital format and stored them on magnetic tape for ground analysis. Hawker Siddeley Aviation which had absorbed de Havilland, needed additional customers for the Trident, so entered into discussions with American Airlines in 1960. American demanded an aircraft with a longer range, which meant that the original DH-121 design would have fulfilled its requirements almost perfectly. To fill AA's needs, design began on a new Trident 1A powered with uprated Rolls-Royce Spey 510s of 10,700 lbf thrust, and a larger wing with more fuel, raising gross weight to 120,000 pounds and range to 1,800 miles. AA eventually declined the aircraft in favor of the Boeing 727. Trident 2E some of these changes were added into the original prototype, and it was renamed the Trident 1C. The main difference was a larger fuel tank in the center section of the wing, raising weights to 115,000 pounds and range to 1,400 miles. The first Trident 1, GRPA, made its maiden flight on January 9, 1962 from Hatfield Aerodrome and entered service on April 1, 1964. By 1965, there were 15 Tridents in B's fleet and by March 1966, the fleet had increased to 21. Hawker Siddeley then proposed an improved 1C, the Trident 1E. This would be powered by 11,400 LBF SPAY 511s, have a gross weight of 128,000 pounds, an increased wing area by extending the cord, and the same fuselage but with up to 140 seats in a six abreast configuration. This specification took the 1C closer to the larger concept of the original DH-121, but with 7,000 lbf less thrust. There were only a few sales of the new design three each for Kuwait Airways and Iraqi Airways, four for Pakistan International Airlines, two each for Channel Airways and Northeast Airlines, and one for Air Salon. Channel Airways aircraft were equipped with cramped, 21-pitch, seven-abreast seating in the forward section. Trident 3B At this point, 
BEA decided that the trident was too short-legged for its ever-expanding roots, and that an even longer-ranged version was needed. Hawker Siddeley responded with another upgrade designated Trident 1F. It would have the SPAY 511 engines, a 2.8M fuselage stretch, a gross weight of 132,000 pounds and up to 128 seats in the original 5 abreast configuration. BEA planned to buy 10 1FS, plus an option for 14 further aircraft. As work continued on the 1F the changes became so widespread that it was renamed the Trident 2E, E for extended range. Now powered by newer SPAY 512s with 11,930 lbf thrust, it also replaced wing leading edge droops with slats, and extended the span with Kuchimon style tips. It had a gross weight of 142,400 pounds and a 2,000 miles range. Variants Operators Civil Operators BEA bought 15, while two were bought by Cyprus Airways. CAAC, the Chinese national airline, bought 33. The first flight of this version was made on July 27, 1967 and it entered service with BEA in April 1968. Subsequently, the Trident was becoming the backbone of the BEA fleet and BEA wanted an even larger aircraft. Hawker Siddeley offered two new designs in 1965 a larger 158-seat two-engine aircraft otherwise similar to the Trident known as the HS-132, and the 185-seat HS-134, which moved the engines under the wings, a design very similar to the Boeing 757. Both were to be powered by a new high-bypass engine under development at the time, the Rolls-Royce RB-178. BEA instead opted for Boeing 727s and 737s to fill the roles of both the BAC-111 and Trident, but this plan was vetoed by the British government. BEA returned to Hawker Siddeley and chose a stretched version of the basic Trident, the Trident 3. A fuselage stretch of 5M made room for up to 180 passengers. Hawker Siddeley raised the gross weight to 143,000 pounds and made modifications to the wing to increase its cord, the engines remained the same. BEA rejected the design as being unable to perform adequately in hot and high conditions, in light of such issues experienced with the Trident 2E. Since the SPAY 512 was the last of the SPAY line, extra thrust would be difficult to obtain. Instead of attempting to replace the three engines with a completely different type, which would have been difficult with one engine buried in the tail, Hawker Siddeley S engineers decided to add a fourth engine in the tail, the tiny Rolls-Royce RB162 turbojet, fed from its own intake behind a pair of movable doors. The engine added 15% more thrust for takeoff, while adding only 5% more weight, and it would only be used when needed. BEA accepted this design as the Trident 3B, and ordered 26. The first flight was on December 11, 1969 and the aircraft entered service on April 1, 1971. Addition of extra fuel capacity resulted in the Super Trident 3B. The Trident experienced some key export sales, particularly to China. Following a thawing of relations between Britain and the People's Republic of China, China completed several purchase deals and more than 35 Tridents were eventually sold. In 1977, fatigue cracks were discovered in the wings of the British Airways Trident fleet. The aircraft were ferried back to the manufacturer and repaired, then returned to service. 
On January 1, 1986, new ICAO noise legislation came into force, requiring operators of first and second generation jet airliners to have hush kits fitted to their engines. The main British operator of the type, British Airways, viewed the refit as unviable and instead they chose to phase the Trident out of their fleet. A total of 117 Tridents were produced, while the Boeing 727, built to the original specification for the Trident, sold 1,832 units. Several aircraft are either preserved or in storage at various locations in China. Three airframes, one with a broken back, can be seen at the Chinese Aviation Museum at Daitangshan, north of Beijing. In 2008, the personal aircraft of Mao Zedong was offered for sale after a decision by merchants at a market in Zhuhai, China that the Trident, formerly a tourist attraction, was limiting business. Military Operators Aircraft on Display Accidents and Incidents Specifications Notes Citations Bibliography